Ladies and gentlemen, will you now please welcome one of the most insightful commentators of our time, Mr. James Davenport. <laughs> The, the London meeting where I last, last spoke. I recognise some of the faces. Do you remember how it felt back then? Well, I think it was the end of last year. And it felt like we few, we happy few, we band of brothers and sisters, campaigning for this totally hopeless cause. Actually, rather like Agincourt, really, because the result went the same way, didn't it? Um, I think that June the 24th, Independence Day, is going to live in our memories as one of those where were you when you heard the news days. It's going to be like Kennedy's assassination, but in a good way. <laughs> I'll tell you what I was. I was in bed when I heard the news. Had I, had I been known, I would have stayed up all night. Uh, had I been known, I would have put what, 100,000 quid. Uh, at 8 to 1, I think we were getting from the bookies that day. Which shows, I think, just how impossible it seemed, right to the last minute. Really went to the wire, didn't it? And the thing that put me off, that finally put me off staying up all night, was when I was watching TV, and I heard that somebody quite close to the referendum debate had announced, I think Remain has just edged it. And I thought, well, if Nigel Farage thinks we've lost, what hope is there? So I went to bed. And I went to bed in despair, and I set my alarm early, not because I wanted to hear the results, I didn't want to hear the results, I knew we'd lost. I set the alarm early because I was on my way to Glastonbury Festival. I wanted to go and inspect all the, all the Remain people, um, and I <laughs> celebrated the fact that their votes were clearly not going to go into the referendum because they were all um, smoking drugs at Glastonbury, as is their prerogative as, as Remainers. Um, and I woke up, and, and my wife, um, who was already awake, said, uh, we won. <laughs> Don't believe it, I said. Um, and uh, I delayed my, my move to Glastonbury. Um, uh, it had to wait. Um, and I did several important things. Um, the first thing I did was I turned on the TV so that I could bathe in the tears <laughs> of the BBC <laughs> presenter. completely <laughs> unaffected by the result of this thing, and of course they'd taken it in their strike group. That was a joy to behold. Um, the, uh, the second thing I did was I did a podcast with my, with my friend Toby Young, who, along with Charles, we were having a discussion before uh, at the beginning, how very, very few people there were in the media who actually consistently campaigned for Brexit throughout. It was amazing how few of us there were. Anyway, Toby was one of them, so he had a good, a good quote on our, our podcast. And the last thing I did was I bought some shares. Um, I don't know much about stock markets and stuff, but I knew one thing for certain. If David Cameron, George Osborne, Christine Ronsil Lagarde, <laughs> the CBI, Mark Carney, aka the organ grinder's monkey, <laughs> Goldman Sachs, and Paul Mason, if they were all saying the economy was going to collapse, I thought I was on pretty good grounds for putting lots of money on the stock market at that point. Had I done my homework, which I would have done again, had I knew we were going to win, I would have asked my, my stockbroker friends, which share should I buy? Well, I had the clips, I thought we were going to lose. Uh, so in the end, you know what I did? I bought lots of shares in companies with British in their name. <laughs> so I bought BP, British Petroleum that was, I bought British Air, Aerospace and like, British Land. And since then, guess what's happened to those shares? <laughs> Contra all the predictions from the Doomsters like 
Carney, the governor of Bank of England. He's going to know, isn't he? I mean, how could the governor of Bank of England not be right about economics? I mean, he's been, he, he, he worked at Goldman Sachs. He's probably got an economics degree. So he must know. Well, he didn't, did he? Um, so my shares have gone up. I, I, I haven't made a fortune. I, I, unlike the, who was the hedgy who made 220 million? Um, Crispin Andy. Crispin Andy. Crispin Andy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, my, my son said, uh, he's at school with his, with his son, he said, I hope his dad's done all right, right out of this. Like, rather, rather jealously, like, why haven't I got a dad like, like that? Uh, you know, I probably made maximum 500 quid out of it, but, but it wasn't about that, was it? It was about the winning, that's what, it was that, that, that feel-good good factor. Whenever I think about that day, I get a warm glow in my heart. It's my special happy place that I go to. Um, what have we learned from our experience? Well, I think we've learned something rather surprising. And I know, I know you people, because I've spoken to you, and uh, I've always had a really warm reception from you, so I know you are my people, we think the same way. And what I've felt for most of my life is that I was an outsider politically that I was, I was not represented by the mainstream system. I very much felt contramundum, and that, and that wasn't a sort of a position I took to be contrarian deliberately. I just felt that, I, that my views were not represented in the world at large. And what I think we've all learned, much to our surprise, my surprise certainly, is that we are the majority. We are not the 48%. Whiny, the whiny 48% but the victorious 52%. This, it is our country after all. And I think that's a very, very pleasant surprise. And I can tell you why, one, one, one good reason why we all feel this way. If an alien were to come down from another planet and to study uh, broadcast media for a period, and then sort of write a report and tell us about it afterwards, he'd say, well, I can see you're all very concerned about diversity issues. Um, I can see, for example, you've just sacked a 48-year-old comic, a white comic on Louis Radio 4 for being white and middle class. And um, I know from listening to one of your, uh, your leaders, Lenny Henry, um, <laughs> that there really aren't enough, uh, there isn't enough diversity on, on, on your television channel. And I also know from listening to Radio 4, that you're very interested in learning what it was like coping with being homosexual in Ireland in the 1940s, <laughs> and what it's like uh, living in the Asian community um, in, in uh, Rochdale. And, and these are issues of great concern. And what we'd have to say to that alien is actually, no, this is the view of the world, this is the belt and shower, my favorite word, of the BBC. It's not how real people think. We just get this shove. The stuff shoved down our throats, whether we like it or not. We've got to pay this thing for the license fee, and somehow, somehow, our national broadcast has been captured by this alien weird organisation, which has nothing to do with how most people think. So yes, uh, we are the majority, after all. Um, the second thing we've learned is that the establishment elite. You oh, <laughs> say the nicest thing about that. The second thing we've learned, not that we didn't know this already, the establishment elite does not represent us. Now, like, like most of the people in this room, which are all sensible folk, I don't think we've got anything against elites per se. For example, if we were being held hostage, I think we would rather have the cream of our military, the SAS, come and rescue us, rather than, say, I mean, the Salvation Army, say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, like, I like grammar schools. Um, I, 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 like, I like grammar schools. I, li I like academic excellence. I like, I like selection. I believe in all that stuff. But there's another kind of elite, I think, which has been in, far, in, in power for far too long. And I was very struck by this during, in the, in the run-up to the, uh, the EU 
great family. I noticed, and Charles is the exception to this, one of the exceptions, huh? how many of the smart people that I knew, the OEs and, and so on, how remarkably few of them were, were on my side of the argument. And I thought, hang on a second, you're, 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 you're the squire archy, you're, 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 you're the landowners, you're, you, you ought to care about Britain and 1066 and all that, and, and, and Cressy and Agincourt and all the other times we've we've beaten the French, Ben and Remery, Spinar, Malpaque, Trafalgar, etc, etc. Et you ought to believe in the stuff that we, we Brexiteers believe in. And sometimes uh, over a heated dinner party, I would, I would press them on their views about why it was that they were so passionately in favour of Remain. And they really could not come up with any convincing argument. It was all vague stuff, like, like Maybe if, if John T and Hermione wanted to go and go and do a bit of work in, in Paris uh, for BNP Paribas or something, they might have you know, difficulties. Or they want to go and do the, the gap year in Florence, it might, might prove uh, tricky. <laughs> and I can see that if you are, if those are your concerns, then possibly, possibly there might have been an argument for for uh, remaining. Uh, I don't know whether this is going to, going to shock Charles, but. I spoke to um, uh, one of the stalwarts of our local hunt, and I asked him which way he was going to vote. I mean, pretty much everyone in Northamptonshire, where I come from, pretty much everyone was 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 voting leave. It was fantastic. There wasn't a single a single remain poster, and I think it would be talked down pretty quickly. I mean, on the estate where I live, I, I, uh, my landlord ordered up these mega mega posters. Uh, he was passionate. For, for, for the um, but the shocking thing I heard from this chap, who's a source of the local hunt, he said that the Master of Foxhounds Association had, had, had recommended a remain. I was horrified by this. The landowning classes wanted their subsidies. They wanted these are the same kind of people, I'm afraid, who uh, in the time in, in the, the time when Napoleon was a real threat. They wanted really to treat with Napoleon, and they didn't mind too much if Napoleon invaded, so long as they could keep their, their estates. Um, that, that Whiggish tendency um, I said is right. Um, anyway, yes, there, there was that, there was that um, research, in the, in the, I think, uh, written about the Daily Mail the other day, which said that, that the one group that voted solidly for Remain were households with an income of above £60,000. I'm, I'm all for making money and stuff, but I do think that at the same time you ought to have some kind of moral principle, some kind of ideological backbone. And the Romanians did not have any of those things. They had no principle, they had no ideological backbone. So these establishment elite, um, yes, they do not represent us. The third thing that um, I've learned, that we have learned, I think, is that this problem is not about to go away. Um, if I had a penny for every time I saw a tweet from David Allen Green <laughs> explaining why it is that, uh, it is, it, that it, it's going to be illegal for us to leave the European Union, if I had a penny for every time I read an article in The Spectator Online by Nick Cohen explaining why, why leavers are all dangerous lunatic scumbags, um, <laughs> A.C. Grayling tweeted the other day, I mean, I, AC Brilliant, I, I hadn't particularly sort of got a view of him being a thing. He tweeted the other day about how the Remain vote, oh, sorry, the Leave vote was only a sort of an advisory thing, it was an opinion poll. I, I think most opinion pollsters would be quite impressed by a sample uh, which included 17 and a half million people voting in a particular direction. Um, uh, one of the things that's been really annoying me since, um, since since the glorious 24th of June <laughs> result, is this distinction that, is, that has emerged, um, that never existed before, soft Brexit and hard Brexit. <laughs> Where did that come from? Well, I had, a, I had a quick Google, and the first record I could find of it, maybe an earlier one, was I think uh, early in June on uh, the BBC website, <laughs> needless to say. Soft Brexit and hard Brexit are, that's a completely false dichotomy. It's the soft Brexit position is the one adopted by all the Remainers, all the, all the bitter Remainers. That's, that's, that's all, all it is. Um, 
maybe we can talk about the details uh, a, a bit more later. Um, I want to just finally talk about the other point which I think we've learned. And again, it's a really encouraging thing, I think. Um, there have been times over the years where I've been slightly depressed about democracy as a, as, as a concept. Um, particularly as the role of government in the economy gets bigger and bigger. And clearly there was a danger when it reaches critical mass, where there are more people in hop to the state than there are to actually producing stuff. You get a situation where forevermore you're going to get the clients of the government voting for more government. And that's been a worry. Um, and I thought that I thought that the 23rd of June was going to be um, the final nail in the coffin of people who believe, believe in small government and free markets and, and, and Britain generally. I thought that, that was over. Instead, what happened? Something truly remarkable. Uh, the people spoke and made the right decision. The demos. I, I think that's a glorious, a glorious thing. That there was one really mo nasty moment towards the end, and we all know what it was, when, when, when Joe Cox was, was murdered. And I think a lot of us thought at that stage it was over. Particularly the way it was being slightly exploited by the, the Remain campaign. Slightly. Um, and I was talking to, I was talking to, some, to somebody intimately involved with the, with the Leave campaign. And he said, yeah. He said, I was worried too. I thought, we, I thought we lost you. But you have to think that actually people in, in Sunderland or, or, or wherever, when they're placing their vote, they don't think, oh, um, if I vote, if I vote leave as I, as I want to do, um, that will make me a bad person and that will make me complicit in the random murder of an MP by, by a madman. Real people don't think like that. That's how they think in the cities and so on. That's how, in the strategy meetings and so on. But real people out there in the country uh, think differently. And they, they make instinctive calculations, maybe gut, gut, um, gut decisions. But as it turns out, the right decisions. So we, we can discuss what's going to happen next. But I think, for the moment, let's all give ourselves an enormous round of applause.